Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And today I'm going to be talking about herbs, of course, not a new subject here, but if you are new, you may want to hear what I have to say because I have a lot of videos out and a lot more still yet to come, breaking down the benefits, both medicinal and just basic health, health benefits of different herbs that you can grow. But one of the questions I tend to get a lot is, if I was to recommend herbs, what are my top 10? And I do have a video out on that as well. However, today I wanna to focus more on what are gonna be the best herbs for you? Because I can't just tell you what herbs you should grow because it's going to be very individual according to what do you need, what kind of health things are you looking at, what specific benefits are you looking at, are you looking for pain relievers, are you looking for things to help with topical ailments? And then there's the other issue, if you're going to grow them yourself, what is going to grow best in your area so it's all very individual so i am not a professional on herbs i'm not a licensed herbalist what i do and what i use is all depending on what i've researched so far what i grow and actually use myself and can tell you it actually works and and some there are herbs that i've bought and used as well and have since started growing them so I can tell you what works good in my garden and what works good for me, but here's the other thing. Even if you're looking for a good pain reliever, what works for one person may not work as well for another. So it's good to have a knowledge of what many different types of herbs are good for that particular thing so that you can experiment. And I recommend trying them out first before you try growing them, as in, like go to Mountain Rose Herbs, that's a really good place to get some good organic non-GMO herbs that for a decent price, especially if you're gonna uh, bulk buy so you can kind of save a little bit on the shipping. And that's been one of my favorite places to get herbs that I didn't already grow. The other favorite place for me to get them is to, is to go get the Frontier brand or the Star West brand through Amazon, you can usually get some pretty good prices. I'll link to a couple of the ones below because I always buy in bulk. I always buy at least a pound. And both Star West and Frontier will put theirs in Mylar bags, which is really nice. Mountain Rose, last time I bought from them, they put it in a thick plastic bag, but that's not a big deal if you want to just put it in a, you know, a jar and vacuum seal it for later. So let me go over some of the herbs I have here. I brought these all out. I'm not necessarily gonna talk about each individual one, but these are just a, some of the herbs that I grow for various different reasons. And I'm always still trying new ones, but these are the ones that, I, that work for us. So for example, right here I have catnip and I have feverfew. And these two I like to use in conjunction for a pain reliever. Now for another person, they might wanna try wild lettuce. I haven't messed around with wild lettuce. I can't tell you how well it works. Um, there's some skepticism about wild lettuce that you have to be a little careful with it because too much of it can be toxic. But then again, fever few, you shouldn't take if you're pregnant. Catnip, I would guess is per virtually safe, but don't trust my word for it. Again, I'm not licensed in any of this stuff. I study about it, but I don't necessarily remember everything. So this is why having good uh, medicinal herb books on hand is important. Now this one was sent to me uh, from Mary over at Mary's Nest, and this is better than the one I had that I bought. I love this one. So this one is more specific to our area and focused specifically on medicinal herbs. So this would be things that grow both wild and that you could easily grow in your own garden if you live in our area. So looking for a book like that, I'll go ahead and link to this one below. Um, I know you can find this one on Amazon so that if you're in the Pacific Northwest, this is the book I recommend. And then in conjunction with that, I recommend uh, these books here I'll talk about. And this one is a really good one for uh, the value. This one, I think I paid only $8 for it when I bought it. I don't know what it is now. I got it from Amazon. This one is by Kat Ellis. She used to do a show. I don't know if she still does, 
on the Purple Broadcasting Network. But it's very simply laid out. There's not a lot, there's no color pictures or anything, but that's what helps keep the price down on this one. So if you're looking for something more economical, I recommend this. And I like the way she words stuff. Easy to read and follow. And then for a more encyclopedia style, this one, I don't know if there's any new, new additions. I actually have two of these, um, and I bought them both at garage sales. So look at garage sales, look for you. So whenever I link to any of the books, um, I recommend looking for the used ones. You don't have to buy brand new. You can go to that link and then look in there on Amazon and see if you can find used ones. Because I, whenever possible, I'll get my books used because I have got just like perfect condition books that were labeled as acceptable, paid a much better price. In fact, one of my got even had the autograph by the author, <laughs> which which was pretty cool. And and that was, I'll talk about that in another video, but uh, that was pretty interesting. But anyway, um, look for the used ones. You're gonna pay a lot less if you go that route. So uh, anyway, the Rodale's Illustrated Encyclopedia of Herbs is gonna break down quite a bit for you. This one is pretty, uh, pretty thorough. So that's why I recommend this one. Now, a couple that are really good for recipes and for just easy reading that I also highly recommend are, and I talk about these a lot, Rosemary Gladstar's Medicinal Herbs. Keep in mind, she's a little more new agey. Um, so you may prefer Amy's book, Amy Fuel, and hers, The Homesteader's Herbal Companion, another really good book. And I'll, again, I'll be linking to all of these below. I'm not sure if you'll be able to find this one used yet because it's still fairly new. But uh, very well put together, lots of good, lots of nice photographs in here. Um, the Rosemary Gladstar's book has even, you know, has full page photographs as well. But both of them have good recipes in them. So I don't know, I, I like them both. I would have a hard time choosing between the two other than the fact that, like I said, that if, you know, if you're more new agey, that, okay, then this might be the book for you. Um, so some of the wording in it to me just kind of, you know, I have to overlook and if you're if you're a believer like me then you know just just sort of ignore that stuff but there's still good valuable information or again Amy's book highly recommended so it's very important that you have some good hard copies on herbs on hand but to get you started in finding the herbs that are going to work best for you start researching and I've talked about this in another video before and I don't know it was a while ago so it's good for me to mention this again Start by, as long as you have internet, this is a good way to go about it. Put in your browser, medicinal herbs for, and then put in what it is you're looking for. So medicinal herbs for pain, or medicinal herbs for eczema, or whatever it is that you're looking specifically for, because these are things that you tend to deal with a lot, or specifically migraines even, because migraines are a different kind of pain than other kinds of pain. Feverfew is recommended uh, for migraines, but there's many other herbs out there like white willow bark and oh, just so much more. So look at these things and then research what's gonna work best for your area as far as if you wanna grow it, what's gonna work best. And again, don't forget to maybe buy some small packets from different places to find out if it's even gonna work for you before you consider growing it. Now, uh, as far as skin goes, some of the ones I would recommend would be Comfrey, Borage. Borage is typically pretty easy to grow for most people, and, and so is Comfrey. <laughs> these, in fact, both of these things can kind of take over. Borage pulls up really easy though, where Comfrey doesn't pull up as easy, but it has so many other uses that I recommend it. Um, also th consider your wild herbs like uh, plantain. Almost everybody has plantain just like d uh, dandelions growing wild. And plantain leaves are excellent for healing skin things. In fact, the one time, the only time I've ever needed was when I got a sting. I was out working in a garden. I had a wasp land on my arm and I did one of these things, you know, not thinking about it because I was busy. And then I noticed it was starting to hurt and I realized it was a wasp. And so, um, I quickly looked for a, a, a plantain, took a leaf, chewed it up, stuck it on there, and within two minutes, the pain was not only gone, it didn't even leave a mark. So I can definitely attest to plantain, and that's easy to find. So 
look that one up. I don't have a video specifically on plantain yet. I will eventually, but look that one up. And before I forget, I'm not going to link to a whole bunch of individual videos. I'm going to link to my medicinal herbs playlist right up here. And last, at the end of last summer, I was just starting to get into talking about culinary herbs and their medicinal and health benefits. So don't overlook your culinary herbs. Things like sage and basil and rosemary and thyme. These, these are all just incredibly beneficial and have medicinal benefits to them as well. They're not considered medicinal herbs necessarily, but they do have medicinal properties or, or, and can be helpful in various things. Culinary herbs are great because they also have other uses such as using to season and flavor your foods. And that, you know, those are really good places to start. In fact, I say, if nothing else, start with the, start with herbs like oregano, sage, thyme, and rosemary. Start with those, and basil. Basil is the, is the only one that I've lit out of those five that's an annual, but the other four are typically pretty easy to grow. Rosemary and thyme are a little harder in our area, but there's a trick to it that I finally figured out that works for us. I will talk about that in another video. Now, I want to talk a little bit too about herbs that have multi-use properties. So something like uh, borage, for instance. Borage is the one with the beautiful star-shaped blue flower. I love it. It is one of my favorite things because the leaves, if you pick them when they're young and tender, they're really good in salad. They have a nice cucumbery flavor. If you wait till they're bigger, they're still useful. You can dehydrate them up and then crush them and add them to your mixed greens blend. There's a lot of good nutrients in your borage leaves. The flowers can be used in salads, fresh, they're tasty, and they're beautiful. I have, you know, a whole video just on borage and why I recommend it, but another multi-purpose herb and another one of my very top favorites is the marshmallow. So I have both marshmallow leaves and flowers, these are from my plants, and marshmallow root. The whole plant has benefits. This is why I love marshmallow so much. It's beautiful, uh, it's multi-purpose, it's medicinal, and uh, I like to make teas quite a bit out of both the both of these. The leaves and the flowers have more uh, a little more sweeter flavor to them than the root. The root to me tastes kind of rooty, but it's good. It's and it's very good for it's very uh, soothing to the mucous membrane. Has very many other great benefits, and I also of course have several videos out on marshmallow root. But here's the other thing, is that you can pick the leaves fresh, they're very soft, they're not pokey like the borage leaves when they get bigger. They're very soft and tender and you can tear them up and put them in salad. They add a nice flavor and more nutrition. I highly recommend marshmallow. If you can grow marshmallow in your area, I recommend growing it. Again, it's going to be entirely up to whether or not it even grows in your area, but give it a try. At least try it and see if it will work because I didn't think it would actually grow here because we don't get as much sun as other places, but we have nice, you know, our summers can be pretty nice. We have nine months of rain, typically, and then three months of dry weather, and then it immediately goes back to the rain. So we get our 120 inches of rainfall typically in that nine months. Now, woolly lamb's ear is another one I recommend because of its multi-purpose. It is a very soft velvet type leaves that can be used as a bandage. It can even be used as a toilet paper replacement if you need it, but it is also a tasty, the leaves make a really nice tea. And they have, again, a lots of great benefits to your health. So look into that. There's other plants that are very similar to the woolly lamb's ear that may grow better in your area than this one. The woolly lamb's ear is the one with the purple flowers. There's one similar to it that gets yellow flowers. Lane, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But, um, and then another one good for skin is yarrow. And then of course there's calendula. If you can grow calendula, highly recommended. Uh, the calendula flower, again, is another one of those that has so many uses to it both internally and externally. A lot of people think of calendula for external because you you know you see calendula salves, but it makes a great tea. You can add them to salads. I've added them fresh to homemade tortillas and pancakes and uh, I use these a lot. In fact, most of the herbs that you'll see out here I also use in my soaps or I even use in my homemade skin creams. 
So Echinacea is another one I highly recommend because it is also has so many properties and benefits and uses. So not only is it good medicinally for coughs, colds, flus, and pain, the leaves are delicious, right? I think they are anyway. I love eating the leaves right off their, the plant and they're so good for you. You could also add those and the flower petals to salads. I've used this in making and adding to my cough, cold, and flu remedy. I make teas out of it, uh, all kinds of great stuff you can do with echinacea and it's a beautiful flower to add to your garden. Lavender is another highly recommended one. The more I the years go by and I grow lavender and I use it, the more uses I find for it. So I've actually been starting to use it in my teas, even though I never really cared for the taste of the flowers. If you mix it just right and don't put too much, it actually can make a very flavorful tea that's very calming, soothing, and just a lot of great properties to it. And the leaves are also edible and have a very nice flavor. I use the leaves quite a bit for seasonings in Italian sauces and um, other types of sauces. It's a sort of a sweeter type of rosemary flavor, uh, much sweeter, not as, uh, not as pungent as the rosemary. And so you can use the leaves and the flowers. So don't forget that. And I have a video just on using the lavender leaves. So another recommended one. And of course, mint. Everybody should be able to grow mint. I mean, the last time I mentioned this in a video, I said, except for maybe if you're in the middle of the desert, and I meant if you have absolutely no access to water, you're still going to want, your plants are still going to want some water, but people in the desert, in the middle of the desert, were saying they grow mint just fine. So I think pretty much everybody should be able to grow mint. It'll take over if you're not careful, but I, a lot of people will say, try to keep it contained. It's hard to keep it contained. I try to grow it mostly in the, I do grow it amongst other herbs and in the peripheral of my garden. So I, my two favorite mints are peppermint and mojito mint. And I use these in teas quite a bit and for making extracts. If you can grow nasturtiums, highly recommended. The flowers are wonderful, fresh. They have a great radish taste that adds brightness and flavor to your salads. Um, the flowers can be dried like I have here and be used in your soaps, in your homemade shampoos, you know, and even in skin creams and stuff like that. And the leaves, the leaves also are good in salads. They also have a bit of a radish taste, not quite as sweet and strong as the flower, but still quite good. But my main purpose of dehydrating up the leaves and saving them is for making a homemade antibiotic. Very powerful antibiotic and it works and I can attest to that. A few more I recommend are pansies, especially if you look for more the more wild varieties, the smaller ones, not the big cultivated ones. They're beautiful, but the smaller ones have more medicinal properties. Great for the skin, great internally. They have similar properties to the marshmallow leaves and flowers. And roses. If you're going to get into roses, in fact, I want to get one of these myself, go more for the, just like with the pansies, go for your more wild varieties, not the cultivated ones. Their cultivated ones are beautiful, but you're not going to have as many medicinal properties in your cultivated ones as you are your wild ones. This is not a wild rose. I still use these, but I do want to get the Rosa Rugosa is the one that you want to look at. You know, that one is probably the best one for medicinal properties, if I remember correctly. But you can use those rose petals for all kinds of things. And then, of course, you have your rose hips that we know are high in vitamin C. And then holy basil is another one I just started growing. Actually, I just started growing again because somebody sent me seeds. I tried it a few years ago and they only germinated and that was it. But this time the seeds that a subscriber sent me, I think they all germinated, they all grew, and they did great. But anyway, holy basil, or also known as Tulsi, has a really has a lot of really good properties. People typically use this in tea. It's not the same kind of flavor like an Emily basil that you use for seasoning but it does have this wonderful sweet smell and flavor to it that um, I don't really know how to describe it, but I recommend this one. And then don't forget your other wild growing herbs such as dandelions. Now I use all parts of the dandelion. I use the flowers, I use the roots, and I use the leaves. I use them all differently. The flowers I tend to use a lot either for teas and or for skin related things 
I use them in my soaps quite a bit. This can be, if, if you can't grow calendula very well, then just let your, your dandelions grow because they have similar properties to your calendula. Calendula, you can only use the flower, whereas dandelion, all parts of the plant are usable, even the stem. And then right back here, you can see uh, this is dandelion root that I had harvested. I harvest mine in the spring. It's actually best to do it in the fall for the most nutrients, but around here, it's best to harvest in the spring. I get nice big dandelion roots in the spring because they're actually the, the dandelions from the year before and they pull up easier for me in the springtime. And so I'll be harvesting some dandelion roots pretty soon and drying them up, but really very, lots of great health benefits in the dandelion root and in the leaves. The leaves get dehydrated and put into my mixed greens blend that goes in everything I cook pretty much throughout the year. Um, I've even got to the point where I've started just sprinkling it on top of different things that I eat. If, I, if I'm not having something that I already have it cooked into, then I just sprinkle the dried stuff on top. So again, this is just some of the herbs I grow, and this is just to give you an idea of things I think you should consider for your garden, but don't stop there and don't and look into them first to make sure that these things will even grow good for you and find if it doesn't, then there's it's guaranteed that there is an herb like it. So let's say um, lavender doesn't grow good for you. Or like I said, the calendula. There's going to be an herb that's similar to it that will have similar properties that should grow in your area. Yarrow, for instance, I know grows wild along the coast over here in the Pacific Northwest. Yarrow has a lot of great benefits, both internally and externally. I started growing it specifically for skin ailments. However, if yarrow doesn't grow well for you, then it's very likely that comfrey will grow quite well for you. So look into those. Comfrey is a matter of debate as far as internal, you know, some people make a tea out of it and it's fine. I think you just have to really look into it for yourself and find out how safe it's going to be for you. Yarrow, is, I would say as far as internally, in my personal opinion and from what I know, is probably a little safer for using internally. But again, my main reasons for growing these is for external purposes, you know, for skin ailments. Comfrey, in fact, is known as bone knit. It helps to heal bones, believe it or not. And like the echinacea, maybe echinacea won't grow great for you, but you want something for cough, colds, and flus. Then consider growing elderberries. Elderberries may, might grow black elderberries in particular, black or blue, black especially. Um, we're growing the black elderberries here. Even though the red ones grow wild around here, it's hard to find the black ones. So I'm growing those as well really good for cough, colds, and flus, and high in vitamin C and all that. So just, just really research. Find out what's going to work best for you. Find out what you need. And the one thing I want to add, if you start looking stuff up online, don't get yourself stuck on one web page. You need to cross-reference everything because sometimes, a lot of times, what you're reading is either a copy from somebody else's website that somebody copied all the information and pasted it over to their own page, or it's, it's personal opinion. Like me with these, these are my personal opinions. These are what personally work best for me. And so you need to cross-reference everything. So it can take a while. So start with what's most important to you. Do you have migraines? Look into that. If that's something that you suffer with most, start, start there. And then research all the herbs that you think are gonna work best for you see what all the different people say and then also you know try to find the most scientific based site that isn't controlled by big pharma so i'm going to go ahead and say i recommend avoiding places like webmd and there's another one and now i can't think of the name of it there's top, two top ones that people tend to go to a lot but it's really easy to see who controls them uh when it comes to medicinal herbs a lot of times they may not they don't always give the best recommendations because if you look at who's putting the ads on their pages, that'll tell you who they're funded by. They're going to downplay the benefits of medicinal herbs and even try to use scare tax to say, oh, you gotta be afraid of this. Well, I tell you what, I'm far more concerned about the ingredients and the toxic drugs that they're, they're giving people without, with very little research on their safety and their efficacy and than I am about the few possible side effects we can get from herbs. I mean, if you look at them side by side, you can pick one herb like a nasturtium, find a long list of benefits, 
and I don't actually think there's any safety issues with nasturtiums personally, but uh, yarrow, let's say yarrow, okay. Yarrow might have a long, it does have actually a super, super, super long list of benefits with the possible side effect here, maybe if you're pregnant, possibly. Okay, so which one am I gonna choose? That one or the big pharma drug that has a long list of side effects and then the possibility it might work for one thing, for one problem. And then, you know, mixing the two together, when you start mixing different pharmaceuticals together, there's no actual safety studies done on what could happen if you start mixing a bunch of different pharmaceuticals together. They don't do them. They, doctors will just keep prescribing, oh, here's this for the symptom that you have from that drug and the symptom you have from that drug. No, let's give you a drug for that symptom from that drug that was for this, to cover up the symptoms from that drug. No, <laughs> that's not how it should be done. It's totally backwards. So uh, if you're a believer like me, I believe that God gave us all this stuff for a reason. And there's, you know, scripture right at the beginning in Genesis that talks about the, the, the herbs being meat for you. And even if you're not a believer, same thing applies. If you believe that evolution brought us here, then you should be able to believe that we have evolved to be able to use nature to help heal our bodies. So it applies no matter what side of, the, of your belief that you're on. The natural way is simply the best. And that not, is not just an opinion, it's what I can honestly believe is fact from what I've seen in my own life. Don't forget, if you're new to my channel, you may not realize this, Patrick and I were both on thyroid medications for 15 years each. And about seven years ago, I took, I weaned ourselves off the thyroid medications and we're doing great without them, without the doctor's approval. Doctors believe that once you're on thyroid medication, you need to be on it for the rest of your life. What most of them don't know is that is not true. And we're living proof of that. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something new and it helps get you on the track of what, of what you wanna pick and study and put in your own personal herb garden. All right, thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.